Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. The Road to Autonomy is brought to you in part by Stantec Generation AV. Stantec Generation AV combines some of the most experienced AV experts in the industry with the resources of a global engineering firm. Stantec Generation AV provides education, consulting, assessment, and guidance to any industry interested in autonomous vehicles. Learn more at Stantec.com. Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to welcome Xander Cook, co-founder and chief operating officer of LeeScent. Xander, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you here because the end of the lease scenario, it's complicated, it's frustrating, and frankly, it's an annoying, horrible experience for millions of individuals that turn their, their lease in every year. Let's start, let's kick it off with this. The average price of a new vehicle has risen more than $10,000 since the start of the pandemic to an average price of 47920 in January 23. That's a massive increase in price. What are you seeing in the leasing market? Are you seeing an uptick in individuals that might opt to lease a vehicle instead of buying it on day one because the rising cost of vehicles? To this point, it's been a little counterintuitive. Actually, leasing had its worst year as a percentage of new vehicle sales in decades last year, 2022, the numbers of new leases that were originated were down a ton, which is interesting. As you mentioned, new car prices just skyrocketing. Part of the reason for that is rates obviously went up and rates tend to affect leases more than purchases, at least initially. Also, these manufacturers didn't have vehicles on their lots, and so they weren't really incentivizing lease programs like they had in the past. So those two factors kind of led leasing to have its worst year in terms of new originations in in decades so what role did the excess savings from all the COVID stimulus play in that it was uh, somebody's feeling rich and feeling good hey i can buy this and not have a payment if the economy turns was we're seeing what's happening now i don't know I, I, I imagine that had some effect don't know to what extent you know obviously we saw that effect in all different areas of the economy people purchased more than they had in the past because they had some extra cash in their pocket i i I think we would be naive to think it didn't affect vehicle sales. I don't know to what extent, per se, there is definitely an effect there. And then the other aspect that I, I did a lot of research and studying on was the flipping of vehicles, especially the, the Tesla Model 3s, the Ys, and, and the mach E's. Individuals will pay the $1,000, $2,000 deposit, get the vehicle, immediately they finance it, then immediately go flip it to a dealer a day or two later. What impact did that flipping have on the market? I, I think these are all just weird, weird things that have bubbled up out of the equity in vehicles, you know, with these, with used car prices, new car prices, both skyrocketing. It, 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 there are a lot of strange phenomenon kind of came out of, came out of the woodworks and with a scenario that frankly never happened before where new and used vehicle prices both increased year over year to, you know, generally that'd been a depreciating asset. That's why you leased it. Like, oh, at the, at the end of this, I, I can just give it back and, and not have to worry about it. You said 2022 is, was one of the, the worst years for lease origination. How is 2023 shaping up? Is the 2022 trend continuing? Or are we starting to see leases start to populate properly again? Yeah, early data, it looks like it's going to be, it's going to continue to be below the historical norm. But higher than 2022. So it seems like 2022 was the rock bottom. It's it's back on its way up, but not quite there yet. At least, you know, in the early going here, only a month or two into the year. So then there's the individual that leases a vehicle and at the end I was one of those individuals. You have equity in the end of the at the end of the lease. What options are those for those individuals that have equity? What can they do? So super common scenario these days. Uh, obviously, most of these people, when they lease their vehicles, they had residual values that were a set amount when they leased these vehicles three years ago. Used new vehicle prices, both have skyrocketed since then, causing most people coming off lease to have significant equity in their vehicle. Didn't necessarily used to be the case, but today, most people coming off lease have equity in their vehicle. For those, for those who do have equity, it opens up a whole host of options. First and foremost among them, you, you have the opportunity to buy out your lease and keep your vehicle and have some pre-built equity already into that vehicle that you've bought out. It also allows you to just, if you don't necessarily love the car and you don't want to keep it, allows you to buy it out and then turn around and sell it and just keep that equity portion that you had, put a little cash in your pocket to go purchase a new vehicle. And then obviously every lease you have the ability, what makes leasing appealing to just turn it in at the end of the lease and just wipe your hands and be done with it and, and walk away if you so choose. So 
options one and two there hadn't been as popular in the past because there hadn't been as much equity, but most people these days tend to keep their lease and either quickly turn around and sell it or just continue to drive the vehicle because they've had years to drive it and they like the car and they are, they're good in a good equity position. And so they want to just continue to drive it. On the equity standpoint, Lisa and the company that you co-founded, you published really interesting data on leases. And there was an interesting thing that I noticed. Honda has the highest average equity car lease buyout. Why Honda? What's going on there? Honda makes affordable vehicles, right? And that's what's most in demand these days. With vehicles getting more and more expensive every year, everybody wants something that's a little smaller, a little more economical. And, you know, you think of Honda, you think of Civics, you think of Accords. And, you know, those are the kind of vehicles that people can still afford. So they're in hot demand and really hold their hold their value, which leads to people who lease those Civics and Accords having the most equity on average at the end of a lease. What other brands are you seeing hold their equity? Is it perhaps the, the Toyota Corolla? Is it perhaps a Kia or a Hyundai? What other st- uh, interesting stuff are you seeing in the data? Yeah, so right right now there isn't a brand out there that doesn't, you're not in a positive equity position on average. There are obviously some that are stronger than others and you hit hit the nail right on the head. Toyota, Kia and Hyundai, all in that similar vein, these these manufacturers that tend to make more affordable vehicles tend to on average have, have stronger equity values right now. When we move to an all electric future and consumers begin to lease electric vehicles, will it be equity? I'm saying that because I think about, okay, the average electric vehicle has a five-year battery warranty. And we've seen the receipts on Twitter and Reddit. I believe it was a, a, an old GM uh, Chevy Bolt. It was $48,000 to replace the battery. <laughs> the battery was worth more than, than the car. Where, do, where does lease then come there? Because you're seeing terms 40 even came out. At the end of the lease, no, you have to give it back. You, you, you can't own it. What's that going to do to this whole model? Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's interesting. I, I, I'm not, I'm skeptical that that model is going to work well and people will actually, actually lease those vehicles because the whole, the whole reason you lease is so you have this added optionality at the end of the lease to either keep the vehicle or turn it back in. If you don't like it, it's like almost you get an extended test drive. If you, if you take away that optionality, it's like, no, you're turning this back in no matter what, then you've taken away I, what I believe is the most important and most appealing thing about leasing. I'm, you know, obviously the manufacturers want to do that because then they get to capture the equity. They get these nice vehicles back that they can turn and resell and make a good profit on. So it's in their best interest to get these vehicles back. But I think it's going to hurt people signing up for that lease in the beginning. You know, like most consumers aren't stupid. They're generally not going to want to sign up for that. You can make the argument you're using the customer to your advantage, not to theirs. Then if I'm going to put my brand hat on, that's going to have massive brand damage to this because Cooper started talking. I leased this vehicle and I had equity and they made me give it back. How dare mm-hmm. they do that? And then all of a sudden, now you've got a tidal wave of outcry and then guess who comes knocking? Congress. And that's when <laughs> you've got a big problem if you're the OEM when Congress yep. comes knocking on your door. Or, or if you're, you know, you're Ford and GM decides to let their customers buy their electric vehicles out at the end of the lease, you know, Ford's going to quickly follow suit and they'll fold quickly. But maybe it doesn't affect it. Maybe maybe consumers don't care to buy out their lease. I, I don't think that's the case. I think most people want, they, they lease for that optionality, at least for low payments. So you take away that optionality. I think it takes away one of the key features of a lease. And then another key feature of the lease is there's the loophole in the Inflation Reduction Act. If you lease a vehicle with a high sticker price, you can get the $7,500 EV tax break by leasing it instead of buying it. Are you seeing that consumers are opting to that to take advantage of that tax loophole right there? I've heard stories of it. We, we don't, we're not dealing with consumers as much at the beginning of the lease. So and that's a little bit of a newer phenomenon. So I'm, I'm not as well versed there, but I've definitely read stories of, I think it's Volvo now allows you to just, they'll be on the hook for that tax credit. They'll go and collect it for you in a year and they'll give you that $7,500 right now up front on your lease. So there's starting to be manufacturers out there that are toying around with some of these ideas to drive more people into leasing a vehicle because they haven't been leasing as much the last couple of years. And and manufacturers rely on these leases. They, they want them to come back. It's a, it's a source every three years of new customers coming around looking to either re-up or refinance or whatever they choose to do. It just It's a driver of business back into the dealership. It also builds brand loyalty. If you have a good experience with that brand and says, okay, the, the pull forward program, 614, your lease ends. Oh, we'll put you in a new vehicle. Don't worry about it. Hey, in the meanwhile, we're getting our car back. <laughs> this works out for us, but they're, they're building the loyalty. 
a lot of the, our listeners, and including myself, you turn in a lease vehicle and you sit there and you and you watch the mailbox for that dreaded bill. Oh, you had a ding here. Oh, you you went over that. Is there ways of technology that you're developing at lease end or, or things you see in the market to avoid that dreaded bill that comes at the end of a lease or something you perhaps didn't even know about? The best way, and I, really the only way, is to buy out your lease. If you buy out a lease, you avoid every fee, you avoid every over mileage fee, you avoid every dent, ding, scratch, wear and tear, something they can put put on you. If you if you choose to buy it out, all that goes away. So that's probably another reason why we see so many people choosing to buy out their lease. They they may be over miles by a couple thousand miles and you go turn that in, you're going to get hit with a thousand dollar bill. Well, I don't want to pay that right now. I'll just buy out my lease. And when you do that, the miles don't matter. The condition of the vehicle doesn't matter. So if you have a vehicle and it's in rough condition or you've blown past your lease mileage, buy that vehicle out. It's the best way to not have to come out with any money out of pocket at the end of the lease. Okay. That model, you have to go deal with either the bank that owns the note or you're going to go to the dealer and do it. But you have a model where you just put your VIN number into, into leasesend.com. You can do it. What does that process look like for an individual? Is it a long process? Is it complicated? What does it look like? Our entire business is streamlining this lease buyout process. So to quickly answer the, the question of how long it takes, the fastest we've gotten one of these done before is 25 minutes. So from beginning to end, have a loan be done. If everything goes smooth and that you have all your ducks in a row, you can be at it in and out of here in less than an hour. Typical customers take a little bit longer than that, but it's no long drawn out process by any means. What we, what we help people do is weigh their options at the end of the lease. If they, they need financing, we, we partner with all of the big national banks, the TDs, the PNCs, the allies of the world. And shop them, get them the best rate. And then we handle all of the the paying off of the old leasing company. We handle all the title work. We handle all the registration, obviously arranging a new financing and getting all that set up for you. And do it all so you don't even have to go anywhere, do anything, leave your couch. That's what LeaseEnd does. That's what we built a company on. We're just all about helping these consumers get out of their leases and buy them out as quick and as seamlessly and easy as possible. Did you have a horrible leasing experience that led you to founding the company? I'm a serial leaser. I love leasing. I'm the kind of dude who's always turning it. I, I like to have a new car every three years. But I, I kind of came out of the dealership world and been in the dealership world in a, in a previous life and just kind of saw how clunky that, that process was and how painful it was for consumers. Me and my co-founder, Brandon Williams, our CEO, were able to have this cool idea and, and really grow it to where we are today. And it's anyways, it's been a really fun ride, but that's, yeah, just the side of the dealership world is kind of where, where we sprouted from. The dealership world's ripe for disruption. You can even make the argument today that in the future there, there might not be dealers. It might just be a showroom perhaps, or we get to the point where you're just going to do it in augmented reality or, or, or the metaverse that Mark Zuckerberg has away, and then that all goes away. But if that all goes away, there's still, the vehicle, it's metal, it's big, it has to be delivered and picked up. Let's see, I'm the individual, I use lease sense, I want to take the equity out of my vehicle. Who buys it, who picks it up, and, and what are the fees for this transaction? We actually have gotten out of, out of doing that ourselves. We used to go and we had a national network of, a logistic network basically, that would come, we would pick up your vehicle, we'd give you a check on the spot for it. We kind of we wanted to focus solely on the lease buyout experience since that's what most people prefer these days. So we've kind of, we've we've steered away from buying people's leases for them. But what we do for people who do want to sell their leases, a lot a lot of people they don't have a buyer today, right? If you want to sell your lease, your lease is coming to an end this week. You got to make a decision. You probably don't want to keep the car, but you have equity. What we help those people do is we help them get a loan, so they basically have a bridge for you know a month or couple of weeks until they do find a buyer to sell the vehicle. So instead of buying them directly, we've kind of moved to that model. It's been a lot more successful for us. And it's been a better experience for our customers to where, you know, they have full control over who they're selling it to. We'll just help you bridge this lease out a little bit longer so you can extend your decision making window. So your commercial banking partners should just facilitate the loan line and that's up for that individual in that local community to go on Craigslist or sell it to a dealer. Yeah, exactly. And then once they sell it, obviously they pay off the loan and go from there you're building an asset light business here what made you get out of physically touching and handling the cars was it too hard too complicated to scale and I said okay this is we can't really build a big monster of business here 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really just a tech company, right? We're just building these tools to enable people to do this transaction by themselves and do it quickly and seamlessly. And it, it, it was just a messy business, you know, running around the country, dealing with physical vehicles, moving them around, finding buyers for them, whether we were taking them to auction or a dealership or whatever. Just a, a lot more than we could comfortably bite off and chew. It seems to me, based on the amount of individuals that lease around there, I say that this is potentially a very large market. Why is there not, up until now, been more disruption in this market to focus on the ending of the lease? It's a good question. It's one I ask myself all the time, actually. <laughs> the dealer world is very, it's, it's very opaque and archaic, right? I don't know if a lot of people have a clear, unless you've come out of that world, you don't have a clear understanding of the inner workings of it and know the places that you know you could potentially be disrupted. And then a lot of people in the dealer world are, are all about protecting the status quo and not necessarily bucking the trend there. So I think those two factors combined kind of makes it so you don't see as much innovation there, even though there's a lot of opportunities to really do some cool stuff. There's a lot of opportunities to do cool stuff. You're simplifying the process, making it better for the consumer. I want to get back to leasing for a moment. I'm, I'm really curious in this conversation. We, we talked about the Honda retaining its equity. Are there certain makes and miles of vehicles that tend to go over their, over their mileage limit in your data? Like, Wait a second. Why does this? And I love to know if you if you know why. Why is it that model does this? There's no strong significant like statistical significance that some tend to go over more than others. There's some that are always more than others. There's some that kind of tend to be. And interestingly enough, the ones that tend to go over more are more the off road brands, the Subarus and like the Jeeps, which is interesting. I wonder if that. And, and I don't know if that's just a phenomenon of the COVID years. To where people were were trying to get out a little bit more, you know, if you have an off road type vehicle, you want to go out and camp, get away from the town to where you can get some fresh air. I don't know what that. I, it's interesting. We've only seen that data for a couple of years, and it's been pretty consistent. But I'm still a little skeptical that there's. It's just random, you know. I don't. I, I don't know. But we have seen that off road type vehicles tend to go over more than than a Civic, for example. Do you see that in certain geographical areas? Let's say Utah, Wyoming, Montana. You might have higher than, say, New York City, Boston, perhaps. Nothing in the data that shows that there's anything crazy there. Again, that's, which probably blasts my hypothesis of the off-road stuff out of the water. I don't know, but no strong correlations in terms of geography and, and people going over their mileage. You could make the correlation that it's the brand. Mm. Brand attracts a certain type of consumer. Because if you're in New York City, you you can go upstate New York. Mm-hmm. You can go into Pennsylvania. You can go up to rural Maine. It, perhaps it's the it's the brand that's attracting individuals to drive. And if it is the brand's attracting to them, do Jeeps and Subarus tend to have more mileage allowances just based on that their customer loves a vehicle and loves to drive? Not necessarily. They're all pretty standard right now. You get your two-year 24, your three-year 36, you know, and it's... I don't know if they've changed their programs recently. I'm not sitting in a Subaru dealership, but from what we see coming off lease, they tend to just be three year, 36,000 mile leases almost exclusively across the board. I'm going to put on my political hat here for a moment. We're seeing a lot of movement over the last couple of years in Congress against the banks and overdraft fees, trying to eliminate the overdraft fees or cut the overdraft fees. And Congress is saying it's for the benefit of the consumer. And you can take either side of that argument. Do we get to a point where perhaps mileage over fees are the next overdraft fees that Senator Warren or, or an individual says, hey, that's the next thing I'm going after, and that shakes up the whole market? Do we get to a point where that could potentially happen since consumers are having to pay for all this mileage? Even though it's in a contract that says you can't do it, they're still doing it. Same thing with overdraft fees. It's in a contract, you can't do it, but they allow it. I don't know on the over mileage fees if that's if that's something that they're going to put their target. I, I'm Politics gets crazy real fast. Who knows where we're going to be at in two years? But the mileage overage fees, I, I think they're, they're always disclosed in the contract. That where, where I could see regulators getting a little more focused on is in terms of like police fees. You know, if, if dealerships are charging disposition fees that are just, it's just a fee to turn in the vehicle, the restocking fees. I could see those being targets. Not necessarily the overage mileage fees, because the, the argument against that would be that the car value is depreciating the more miles you put on it. So you need to compensate us for that, which I, I think you can make a fair argument for that. The ones where you where the argument kind of falls apart is, you know, oh, I got to charge you a three hundred dollar fee to put this vehicle back on my lot. You know, like that's that, that, that one seems to, to be a little more ripe for 
some sort of congressional oversight or something. There's a war on fees going on in the White House and in Congress, and I want to put anything past a politician these days that they want to make a name for themselves and try and drive some campaign cash. I'm not saying it's right, wrong, or indifferent. I'm just saying it's 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 the reality of, of where we live today. I could see it 100%. I, who knows what the next target's going to be. we got 50 states here in the United States. Are there certain states historically where individuals to lease versus buy and, and vice versa? Yeah, hundred percent. There's, it's, it tends to be the the big populous states where leasing is a lot more popular. Biggest leasing states: California, followed closely by New York and New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Florida. Big metropolis filled states tend to tend to lease more than rural areas. Is that because there's there's more corporations there? Perhaps more fleet sales happening there? Yeah, I, I think it also lends just to the lifestyle of those consumers a little more too, where, you know, you live out in the country in Iowa, you tend to own your home, you own your truck or whatever. You live in the city, you rent your apartment, you rent your car, it's just a different mindset and lifestyle. I think that lends a little more to the big city type lifestyle than the, than the rural lifestyle. We touched a lot on the leasing process, what it looks like, but for a listener sitting here and says, this is horrible experience. What can be done to make it more transparent for the end of lease for an individual? Are there certain disclosures that can be made? Is there certain processes? Is it, as we said earlier, certain fees that could be removed? What could be done to make that end of lease process the individual's like, oh, okay, this was a breath of fresh air? In my opinion, the biggest thing there is getting the control back to the consumer. Right now, most consumers think they don't have it, any other option besides going into a dealership and dealing with the dealership and, and doing what the dealership tells them to do. That's not the case. That's why Leeson's founded. It's a, another option for people at the end of their lease to end their lease. So I think just helping consumers understand that there, there are other options out there and that dealerships don't have a monopoly on the end of your lease. And that in and of itself will drive better experiences for people at the end of their lease. Because, you know, obviously, you know, when you have options, you can, the market will tend to tend to improve the experience for consumers. Looking towards an improved experience for consumers, in your opinion, what is the future of leasing? I think leasing really has a bright future, especially as vehicles become more and more unaffordable. I think manufacturers are going to continue to incent people to lease, to lower payments. They're always find, trying to find ways to lower payments. So it's going to be creative lease programs, I think, coming online as soon as this year, towards the back half of the year. So I think leasing has a has a bright future in terms of the percentage of new vehicles that are leased. And then what that does is that just puts a pressure on the end of lease experience to be as good as possible. And it, it, it's really good for lease end going forward, because we are the only loved end, end of lease experience out there. You know, nobody loves going back to their dealership, but everybody loves dealing with us. We're optimistic going forward. You have to be optimistic. The data that I read and study, the vehicle prices are going up because the commodities, as they become electric and the commodity, even though we had the lithium 30% decline lithium price now, they're still going up and they're expensive to make electric vehicles. That's going to provide a lot more individuals to lease the vehicle, and that's going to create a lot of opportunity for lease end to, I'll use the word, quote unquote, perfect the end of the lease experience so the consumer is not stressed out and worried. And Xander, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? Yeah, biggest thing is just that there's more options in the dealership out there. You, you ha- you're in a lease, you're coming to the end of the lease. We, lease End is, is here to help. We're here to protect consumers. We're here to give them the best experience at the end of the lease. And you don't need to, you don't need to go into a dealership. You don't need to go jump through all their hoops to end your lease. There's other options out there. And we believe we are, we are the best best option. You can even have your pajamas on, pour yourself a cup of coffee, log on to leasend.com because there's more there's more options than the dealer. Give leasend.com a shot. The future is bright, the future is autonomous, and the future is leasend. Xander, thank you so much for coming on the Road to Autonomy today. Thank you a ton. Thank you for listening to the Road to Autonomy podcast. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter at Road to Autonomy or email podcast at B-R-U-L-T-E-C-O dot com. The Road to Autonomy is produced by Brulte and Company. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Brulte and Company. The content discussed on this podcast is for informational purposes only. 
and should not be taken as legal, tax, investment, or business advice.